Okay, everyone, we are moving into our reproductive hormones in osteoporosis chapter. So this is going to be 16 in your pharmacology book and chapter 27 in the ATI book. ATI breaks it down really simply. Um, so if you're struggling with the lectures or your pharmacology book, um, dig into that ATI book. It has tons of good information and whatever it takes to process the information, then that's what I suggest you use. And as always, if you have questions, concerns, need further explanation, words that you don't understand, anything at all whatsoever, contact me. So let's dive into the endocrine system here. Um, first, let's talk about an endocrine gland. And just know that an endocrine gland is also known as a ductless gland, okay? There are times, and we'll talk about this just a little bit more as we move along, that endocrine glands have issues. They can become diseased um, or cancerous, and we're no longer able to um, produce certain amounts of hormones, and those have to be removed, okay? And this is where we get into the use of hormone replacements, and we're going to talk about that. Some of the first that come to mind are going to be your insulin and estrogen. Those are the two that I talk about most um, as far as hormone replacements. Um, so let's first talk about hormones. Um, hormones are simply just proteins that are secreted by glands. Um, that's going to be your endocrine glands. And they just change the action of a gland or a tissue. Now, hormones do not need duct work, duct work to reach their um, intended target because they actually reach their target by traveling through the bloodstream until they find that specific receptor site. I don't know if you remember from early on in pharmacology, we talked about <clears throat> it has to fit in just like a little piece of the puzzle in order for that particular hormone to fit into the correct receptor site and to create an action, okay? So if you had an um, antagonist, okay, it's going to have to find that specific receptor site and block um, whatever you're replacing, okay? So just remember, it has to find its specific receptor site in order to bond, therefore causing a change, okay? So let's talk about one particular hormone, um, estrogen. Again, I typically back, go back to estrogen because it's replaced quite often. Um, estrogen, of course, has varying degrees of necessity throughout our lifetime. Um, however, it is not imperative for critical functions. Okay, many times women have their ovaries removed um, for various reasons, and they can still function. Maybe they're not as energetic as they were previously, maybe not as sexually active, or various different things that estrogen would um, increase. Um, so they may not have quite the feeling um, that they did before with all the natural estrogen, but that is something that we can replace in the body, okay? So another example um, that your book uses is insulin. So insulin travels through the bloodstream until it reaches um, its specific receptor sites, which it has receptor sites that can be either the liver, uh, muscle, or fat in fat, okay, so it's going to bond, and then um, that aids in maintaining that blood glucose level, okay. Now, we all know that if our um, beta cells or our pancreatic beta cells stop producing insulin, then that leads us to diabetes, okay. So then if we're diabetic, depending on which type you are, um, you could be an oral diabetic and just take oral medication, or you may be um, having to use insulin as a replacement. Um, so that is kind of an explanation about hormones and how the endocrine glands actually reach their target receptor sites to create a change in the tissue or another gland, okay? So we talked about the removal, therefore creating that decrease in function, and then we use hormone replacement to um, you know, replace what they're missing. And so let's dive in to talk a little bit about hormone replacement therapy.
So hormone replacement therapy um, is just simply drugs that we give to our patients that are going to mimic or produce that natural um, secretion of hormone um, that our body secretes. Depending upon how important the function of that specific hormone is that we're missing or um, has depleted um, is really dependent upon whether your patient chooses to replace it or not. Okay. Not every hormone um, needs to be replaced. Um, so if your patient chooses not to, that's up to them. Um, so the most common hormone replacement, replacement therapies are, of course, your thyroid hormones, your adrenal glands. Remember, your adrenal gland um, secretes your cortisol, your aldosterone. Um, some of the others are your sex hormones, your testosterone, your estrogens. And then, of course, um, hormones that we use for contraception. Um, hormone replacement therapy can be temporary or permanent. Um, if it is temporary, it is typically less than five years that your patient would be taking this. Anything greater than five years would be considered permanent. Um, so when we talk about temporary, I typically refer to menopause. Okay, menopause. I'll just tell you, it can be very cruel to women, um, and I am so thankful that we are able to replace that estrogen that's being um, depleted just by um, the advancement in age, okay? I mean, it truly helps with the side effects, hot flashes and things of that nature in menopause. So birth control, again, is um, a hormone replacement that we don't typically think of because it is temporary. We may take it um, that particular one we may take greater than five years but we don't take it from the time we're born or from the time we're 12 till the time we're 75 80 years old okay so just remember that that is really one of the only hormone replacement therapies that you may take longer than five years but it is not considered permanent now we talk about permanent permanent hormone replacement therapies we typically think about the thyroid um, the thyroid is one of the most common permanent um, uses when it comes to, uh, or replacements, when it comes to hormone replacement therapy. Now, if you think about all the things that your thyroid influence, um, if we can't replace that hormone, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble. So the thyroid is our, what I would call our metabolism mediator, okay? It controls our temperature, it plays a part in our muscle contractions, and it regulates really all of the energy use in our body okay so another hormone replacement that we don't ever typically think of are our patients who have had a sex change that is going to be a permanent hormone replacement therapy for them okay if they've had that sex change then that's going to be a permanent part of their life is um, taking those hormones so um, 
So the hypothalamus produces thyroid stimulating hormone, and you will need to know that. Um, so by producing that hormone, that hormone signals the pituitary gland to signal the thyroid to either produce more or less of T3 and T4. And the way the pituitary gland does that is by secreting thyroid stimulating hormone. So the hypothalamus is actually the, I guess the police of the whole negative feedback loop there. Okay, so you have your hormones are either too high or too low. The pituitary gland is then signaled, um, signaling the thyroid to turn up the, turn up the work, start working or turn it off. And then the hypothalamus says, okay, we're good. You can stop now. We're at a homeostatic environment with our hormones, so just keep doing what you're doing. Okay, so just kind of that negative feedback inhibition. So with the control and that negative feedback inhibition, you this is where if it's not regulating correctly, um, we have hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Okay, so we'll talk about those going forward, but let's talk just a minute about calcitonin. So calcitonin is the hormone secreted also by the thyroid gland. Now calcitonin is important in um, reducing the concentration of blood calcium levels, okay, especially when they're higher than normal. Um, so what calcitonin does is it basically inhibits the production of the parathyroid hormone, which parathyroid hormone regulates serum calcium levels. And so this particular hormone can affect your kidneys, bone, and intestines. So you can imagine how important calcitonin is along with T3 and T4, which leads us to the devastating effects of the thyroid um, malfunctioning. So especially if we cannot replace those hormones, um, it would just your your patients probably would not live very long so just be mindful of when you're studying which gland secretes what and what those particular um, calcitonin what did i just tell you it affects kidney bone and intestines what does t3 and t4 do well i just told you but the thyroid gland regulates so many things, your body temperature, metabolism, heart rate, breathing, all of those things. So as you're studying, remember that if your thyroid is out of whack, as I would say, you're gonna have lots of other things that are also going to suffer because um, if you think about what calcitonin does, um, it's basically suppressing the osteoclasts, okay, the activity in the bones. Um, so if we're, not building bone appropriately, then we're, that's where we run into osteoporosis. So that's why these two chapters are put together or these two um, topics. Okay, so as we start through this chapter, think about what those things entail as far as what the thyroid affects, what it, <clears throat> excuse me, what it secretes. And when you're assessing your patient, what you're going to see in them. So when we start talking about hypo and hyperthyroidism, you can get a picture of what your patient looks like. So when you're testing, you'll be able to maybe visualize that um, to better help you answer the questions. Hypothyroidism. So the hypothyroidism is just exactly what it says. It is an underactive thyroid. So you have a lesser amount of those stimulating hormones. Um, now remember I talked about everything that the thyroid controls. All of those things are going to slow down if you have less of the T3 and T4 circulating. So you're gonna see your metabolism slow down. So that's where you're gonna see your weight gain. Um, just things like that. We'll talk a little bit further about that when we move into the symptoms of hyper and hypothyroidism in the next couple of slides. Um, so an underactive thyroid could be caused by a number of things. First, the removal, of course, of thyroidectomy. Um, 
Maybe you have a patient who's had cancer in that area and then had to have some type of radiation therapy around the head or the neck area. Um, that can sometimes cause hypothyroidism. Um, lithium, you'll see I have that on there. Certain drugs can cause hypothyroidism. Um, so lithium specifically. So remember, um, remember that one. Pituitary disorders, okay? Remember, I talked about the pituitary gland and um, its part in the negative feedback loop. Remember, the pituitary gland is actually the gland that signals the thyroid to make more of the, the hormones, T3 and T4. Um, and then also, if you have an iodine deficiency, that can also cause um, hypothyroidism. Okay, so when we talk about iodine deficiency, I wanna make sure that you understand it's not always related to just salt intake, okay? Um, remember, it's absorbing iodine from food. So when you're going forward, you have to think about some of the foods that contain iodine also. Um, remember, it can't be absorbed anywhere else in the body, only in the thyroid gland. So iodine can come from, um, Certain plants, if they're grown in um, a soil that is rich in iodine, it absorbs that iodine. Therefore, you can get it from some plant foods. You can get it from, of course, our seafoods. Remember, um, some of those seafoods that you um, can eat that would also increase their iodine intake. Um, so as I said in the past, it does slow all aspects of metabolism, hypothyroidism does. It's an extremely important gland in our body. Um, and without it, as I said, it can have devastating effects on a person, even to the point of death. And we'll talk about how death comes into play as we move forward. And we talk about, um, it's a coma and it's called myxedema coma. But we'll talk about that a little bit further um, further on in this lecture. But anyway, just know what hypothyroidism is and know that with hypothyroidism, everything as far as metabolism is related slows down. Okay. And so we'll talk about that when we move into the side effects. So this is what cretinism looks like. Okay. They almost resemble somewhat of a dwarf, I suppose. Um, but again, it's just that lack of thyroxine from birth, okay, that T4. So if it happens before birth, again, that goes back to a lack of iodine um, during pregnancy and the mother's lack of iodine, okay? And it causes, again, those severe irreparable defects. It is not reversible, okay? Um, if your mother is known to have hypothyroidism, Treatment has to be started. If she's not taking anything while she or discovers she's pregnant, it has to be started in early, early ages of um, pregnancy or else this is what your infant could suffer from. And again, I told you everything else that could possibly happen, stunted growth, um, decreased organ function and severe mental impairments. OK, so we definitely want to avoid this if we can at all possible. It's just knowing that our patient has that diagnosis of hypothyroidism even before pregnancy. This is a picture of what your infant might look like if you were assessing an infant who has cretinism or that congenital hypothyroidism. A lot of times these infants are, um, I guess they end up with a diagnosis of failure to thrive because they're not eating. They have poor feedings. Um, they're very lethargic. They cry very little. And they sort of have that jaundice look to them. And then, of course, that hypotonia, as you can see in the um, photo here, that's someone holding up their arms and they have that head lag. Most infants are not going to have that much head lag um, when you're messing with them. So... They're kind of floppy, very little muscle tone. Um, so those are some of the things that you would see in an infant with cretinism. I just kind of wanted you to see what it looks like in an infant 
to remember this can either be um, something that is wrong with them. Either they're completely missing a thyroid or they're not producing enough or absorbing enough iodine to make hormones. So they have that deficiency. Um, so just a couple different things that can cause that. But I just wanted you to see if you were assessing an infant what that might look like and some of the things that you would see in them. So let's move into the drugs that treat hypothyroidism first before we move on to hyperthyroidism. So thyroid hormone agonist. Remember what an agonist does. Okay, it, it's going to help or do something that the body already does. So it basically mimics, mimics the effect of a natural thyroid hormone, which is our T3 and T4. So these drugs will aid in the regulation of metabolism. So everything that the thyroid controls with those secretions of T3 and T4, these drugs will also um, mimic that same process, okay? So remember, agonist does or mimics what the natural body already does, okay? So the two that are listed in your book are your levothyroxine and then lyothyronine sodiums. Okay, the most popular one is the levothyroxine, which most of the time people are just going to call it Synthroid. That's one of the name brands. But anyway, just know that those are the two thyroid hormone um, agonists, okay? Um, you will need to know what those are. I will typically use, I think maybe this test has levothyroxine and um, Synthroid used interchangeably, or they may have them both listed, but you need to be very familiar with those um, agonists and remember what an agonist does so that you're able to better select your answers on this test, okay? If you know what an agonist does and it's asking you a question about mimicking the natural thyroid hormones, you're going to know to pick levothyroxine or the lyothyronine, okay? So, Make sure you understand those. So the two thyroid hormone agonists that we have are our levothyroxine, which I typically refer to it as Synthroid, or lyothyronine sodiums. Okay, um, so they're actually going to do what our body does naturally. Okay, when we give them to a patient. So we have a decrease and we want to replace them, okay? They are both available in um, oral and IV solutions. So the side effects with hormone agonists are very minimal because it is doing something that our body already does, okay? So most of the time you rarely see any other side effects except for the diarrhea, rapid pulse, increased blood pressure, insomnia, sweating, and that heat intolerance, okay? So what I'm trying to lead that to is possible hyperthyroidism initially when they begin treatment. So when I say that, that means these particular patients may need a dose adjustment if they're seeing these expected side effects for a long period of time. They may need a dosage adjustment, okay? So with your thyroid hormone agonist, that levothyroxine, the reason you're seeing that hyperthyroidism is we've given your patient a drug to create more of that T3 and T4 circulating in our system. So again, remember we talked about when you have hypothyroidism, you have a decreased metabolism. So you see that constipation. So we're given a medication to increase that metabolism. So you're going to start seeing some diarrhea, rapid pulse, um, that increased blood pressure. Well, you have more energy. So obviously those things are going to increase because you're probably up and about a little bit more. You may initially see some weight loss, okay? When you're up and you're active and you're moving about, you may see some of that use of those fat stores and that um, glucose in there. So you may see some initial weight loss in your patients who start taking um, levothyroxine. The sweating and the heat intolerance goes back to remember their um, cold intolerance. When their hypothyroidism, when they have that diagnosis, 
they can't tolerate cold. So you're going to see the opposite in the side effects. Okay, so that's that's where those come into play. So everything that you see here is an increase in that metabolism because we've given a medication um, to increase that circulating hormone in our bodies. Okay, so think of it that way. So drug interactions is, of course, our warfarin. So warfarin, let me back up for a second. That's going to be your interactions. Let's go back to the adverse effects which is going to be your um, cardiac and nervous system. Because remember, we're giving Synthroid, again, to increase that metabolism. So as we increase that metabolism, then we're going to start seeing that increase in muscle function and cardiac function. Remember, we talked about, or I talked about calcitonin and how calcitonin um, affects our cardiac function because it controls calcium blood levels. Remember, thinking back, um, so without calcitonin, our muscles can't really contract. Okay, so if we have too much um, calcitonin, then our patient's going to suffer some adverse effects of that. So with levothyroxine or Synthroid, relate that to your cardiac effects. Okay, you may see some chest pain, that angina. angina. Um, you may see even patients come in with heart attacks or heart failure. Okay, now another thing you might see with these patients um, could be an adverse effect of seizure activity. So having said all of that, if you're going to give a patient a thyroid hormone agonist, um, that's your levothyroxine or Synthroid, um, we're increasing that metabolism and seizure activity. So what are you going to think about before you give this medication? What diagnosis or history of are you gonna look for? especially if you're going to give this medication IV, okay? So you're going to look for a seizure disorder or any history of seizures in your patient, okay? If I've just told you that it can have an adverse effect of seizure activity, then you need to be assessing for a history of seizure disorders, okay? Now, let's see. Um, let's go back to drug interactions. So Synthroid does in fact increase the action of warfarin, okay? So you're gonna see an increase in your bleeding times. Um, your patient may bruise more easily, okay? So if you were to see that on the test and you had to pick out you know, some of those things related to um, a prolonged bleeding time um, or your patient who's on blood thinners and um, Synthroid, you have to think about uh, reduced dosages of the warfarin, okay? So also be mindful of Synthroid and levothyroxine and patients who are also taking Coumadin or warfarin. You're going to see those prolonged um, PT, PTT, and our, the, the bleeding levels are going to be increased in those labs. Remember, if your patient's on an anticoagulant, they're probably going to the lab you know, at least monthly for those lab draws to make sure that they're in the therapeutic range. Okay, so we want to be mindful of those. Um, so remember what labs you're looking at when it comes to warfarin, those prolonged bleeding times, and what levothyroxine does um, in a patient who's taking warfarin. You will need to know that. I promise you, you will see that again. So go ahead and jot that down, write it in your little notebook etch it in your brain, you will see that again. So a couple of other drug interactions that you need to be mindful of when your um, patient is taking Synthroid or that levothyroxine um, is your over-the-counters. Remember looking at those um, NSAIDs, okay? Remember when we're taking an NSAID, we're decreasing that protective lining of that COX-1 and COX-2 and therefore, we can also increase bleeding in, in that aspect. Um, and then herbals. Remember, some of the herbals can also increase the effects of warfarin. So make sure, again, that you're doing those drug reconciliations. They're so important. So again, looking for those prolonged bleeding times, that petechia, um, bruising easily. Okay, so those are some of the things that you're going to 
want to look for in your patient if um, they're again taking Synthroid and some type of blood thinning agent. Okay, so remember, look for those in your interactions and you will probably see those again, some of those over the counters, the NSAIDs especially um, in your patients and on testing. So make sure that you are familiar with those also. So when we get that Synthroid or Alethoroxine and we have a new order for that for our patients or maybe they're going home on that medication, we always want to make sure that we are monitoring our heart rate and blood pressure prior to giving that. Even if they're in a facility and they've been taking it you know, for a couple of days, we still want to get that baseline assessment um, so that we can see if they have any of those side effects or those adverse effects. Okay, so always make sure that you're checking your vital signs. Um, and why are we doing that? Well, because if we're giving them this medication, remember we're increasing that metabolism. So by increasing the metabolism and the effects that that T3, T4, and calcitonin have, then you're going to see those cardiac effects. Okay, so remember we're increasing that um, muscle contractility. Okay, so monitor your vital signs. Verify your dose, verify the route, um, and which drug specifically that they are giving. They are not interchangeable. Okay, so you cannot give um, your levothyroxine in place of the lyothyronine. You cannot use them interchangeably. Okay, so verify those specifically. Um, again, reconciling those medications to include your over-the-counters, your um, NSAIDs, aspirin, anything else that might increase that bleeding time. Make sure that you're monitoring for those and educating your patients on the use of those in addition to um, their Synthroid or that levothyroxine. Um, again, you want to assess their pregnancy status. Um, this particular um, type of medication does cross over into breast milk. So if you can imagine you have a baby with a normally functioning thyroid and they're breastfeeding, they may start to see some signs of hyperthyroidism in that infant. Okay, so you're gonna see um, weight loss and a failure to thrive because they can't keep up. Their metabolism is um, working at overtime rates, okay? so. Um, again, assessing that pregnancy status prior to starting that, um, and then also educating your diabetic patients to double check their blood sugars um, often when they're starting therapy with levothyroxine because it can affect your blood sugar. Remember, um, we have increased levels, levels of hormones circulating, and we also have an increase of insulin. Remember, we're, um, those endocrine glands are increasing all of those hormones, so now our pancreas is allowing more cells to take up that energy um, and that in the glucose so they may not need as much insulin or they may need more it just depends so they need to be checking their blood sugars often okay so let's think about the nursing process when we're planning and implementing um, how we're going to get our patient to be compliant with this medication and initial administration. So typically with um, Synthroid and Levothyroxine, they're going to start with a low dose, okay? And then they're going to increase them slowly over a two to three week time frame. That is so they can see if that dose needs to be adjusted either higher or lower depending on the side effects that they may see and the severity of them and of course they're going to do some lab works for that um, and so we'll talk about those next in evaluation now with um, as far as taking in um, food and we're talking about two hours before and three hours after meals um, we're giving them this medication to increase metabolism. So by doing so, we're also increasing that GI motility. So we don't wanna just give them the medication and immediately send it through the GI tract um, with that increased motility. <clears throat> so we wanna make sure that we're educating them on decreasing that amount of fiber initially, um, because what happens is it's decreasing the absorption of 
um, our medication, our Synthroid. So with too much fiber, we have greater motility and less absorption time in the GI tract. So allow for those two hours before or three after three hours after a meal um, when taking this medication. Most of your patients will typically take it at bedtime, but um, again, it just depends. But remind them of the two hours before and after and educate them on why that's important. Okay, so let's talk about the evaluation process of this medication and how do we know it's working or it's not. Okay, do we need to dose, adjust, or not? So always assessing those vital signs in your evaluation once we've implemented and we've given this medication to our patient for x amount of time we're going to go back and make sure that it's working okay that's part of that whole nursing process we talked about in the very beginning so you're going to assess your vital signs well why are we doing that well we've increased their metabolism as i've said a hundred times probably you're sick of hearing that but we assess those vital signs because we are increasing metabolism. We want to check that cardiac function to make sure we're not overloading that cardiovascular system with that increased metabolism. Okay, so assess those vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure. Now, as far as labs, I want you to understand that the thyroid stimulating hormone, that particular lab is the most reliable form um, for evaluating the efficiency or the effectiveness of this thyroid replacement hormone dose, okay? So you're gonna see that again, you need to know that. Um, so the most noted signs again are gonna be your cardiovascular effects. You know, are you seeing um, those level out? Are you seeing those adverse effects? Okay, go back and look at those adverse effects. Remember we talked about that and assess for bleeding. Is your patient experiencing a prolonged bleeding time when you're looking at that lab that your um, PT, PTT, INR, those prolonged bleeding times? Okay, are you seeing more bruising or some fatigue? Okay, so evaluating the effectiveness, um, several things go into that. So make sure that you understand how to evaluate the effectiveness um, so that you know whether your patient needs a dose that is um, increased or decreased. Also, when you're looking at vital signs, make sure that you're looking at temperature. We'll learn a little bit more about temperature as we move forward, but temperature is huge in this because remember I told you your thyroid regulates temperature. Um, you also want to take their weight. Have they gained weight since they um, started taking this medication? Maybe they need a little bit more or have they just you know, lost an extreme amount of weight in a short period of time and now we have an overactive thyroid. Okay, so consider those things when you're looking at your vital signs. Go back to the symptoms, you know, what changed in those symptoms? You know, did your weight change? Did your constipation become um, irretractable diarrhea? Um, things like that. So look back at your symptoms. If you know the symptoms of hypothyroidism, and which, how the medication affects it, and if you're seeing too much of certain things, then we know that we need to change the dose. So go back, know those symptoms of hypothyroidism, because again, on your testing, it's not just gonna ask, it's gonna ask questions in a way that leads you to those assessment skills and those evaluation skills in the nursing process, okay? So make sure you're looking at that, make sure you know why do I say assess your vital signs? Well, don't just say, I'm gonna assess my vital signs. You know what you're assessing, your temperature, your heart rate, your blood pressure, and know why you're assessing those important vital signs, okay? It's about knowing why, digging further into it, not just knowing I'm gonna assess vital signs. Know why you're doing it. Now, lastly, when I talk about assessing for bleeding, remember some of the first signs of bleeding are gonna be in your gums, okay? Those are some of the first signs of excessive bleeding. Um, you may see blood in the urine or in the stool, okay? Look for those things or you know, ask your patient about those, okay? If you, some of this medication, I know Synthroid Elevithyroxine can be given um, IM. If, if you give an IM injection and you can't get that bleeding to stop, then you might wanna look at some labs, see what that uh, bleeding time is, okay? So 
know what to look for when I say assess for bleeding, where are you going to look for that bleeding? What are your signs of excessive bleeding or prolonged bleeding? Okay, understand what it means to assess for bleeding and where you're going to assess your patient to find that. So when we're educating our patient, we need to make sure that we talk about the onset of action. Typically with your oral medications, those are going to take three to five days to really start to see those results. Um, the IV, of course, or IM injections may take less time. But anyway, just let them know that there's going to be a, a lull or a delay in actually seeing those effects. Um, we do not want them to stop these abruptly. Okay, Remember, it can cause a lot of cardiac issues. Um, it affects so many things. We don't want to, as I say, get their body out of whack. So take them as directed. Do not stop them abruptly. If they realize they've missed a dose, take it as soon as possible. Now, if your dose is due at 10 o'clock at night and you didn't realize until 9.45 or 9 o'clock that you forgot your morning dose, if it's taken twice daily, whatever, do not take a double dose. Okay, just you're going to have to skip that dose until the next morning and get back on that regular schedule. Okay, so don't take them within that close amount of time frame because, you know, we don't want to double dose, as I say. So if you, let's say your medication was due at 10 in the morning and you realized at 12 o'clock noon that you didn't take that 10 o'clock dose, it's perfectly fine to go ahead and take that dose, but you don't want to take that double dose you know, within an hour or 30 minutes of each other. Okay, so avoid that double dosing. Take as directed. Remember, those medications are not interchangeable, so make sure they're taking the correct medication. Now, one particular thing that you do need to educate your patient on is checking that pulse rate prior to taking their daily dose. Okay, it's not hard. They don't, all they have to have is a couple of fingers, you know, check that pulse rate. And why are we asking them to check a pulse rate? Well, I hope that in your mind, you're leading to um, the fact that we've increased that circulating calcitonin by giving them this medication. And by increasing, the, increasing that calcitonin, remember I talked about calcitonin and its effects on um, that muscle function. Okay, so by increasing that calcitonin, we're increasing our cardiac um, workload. So if we have a patient who has um, been taking this for a couple of days and they notice an increase in their pulse rate and it's 20 beats greater than what it has been, then they need to report that to their physician as quickly as possible. Now, if they have an increased pulse rate um, greater than 20 beats per minute, I think that's what your book says, um, and they also are having some chest pain, they need to report to the ER immediately. Call EMS or whatever. If they're having chest pain, then you need to just recommend that they, if they're home, call EMS. We don't want them driving with chest pain. Um, and then avoiding aspirin. Remember those additional effects that prolong bleeding, those NSAIDs, your aspirins, or even some of those over-count, over-the-counters herbals. Okay, some of them can um, prolong bleeding also, so make sure that you're educating them on that. Um, so any questions on this particular drug category, please let me know. Severe hypothyroidism can lead to what we call myxedema coma. I know that this is not particularly in your readings um, in relation to hypothyroidism, but if you look in your ATI book, it's important that you know that this can occur with hypothyroidism because this is not off the table for testing. Um, so with my exedema coma, this is severe, severe hypothyroidism. Um, this leads to major um, decreases in mental status, um, temperatures, and ultimately, if it is left untreated, organ failure and death. Okay, so it is an extreme emergency med emergency situation. It is a medical emergency, um, and this has a high mortality rate. So 
it's important that you know about this, um, know that with severe hypothyroidism, this can occur. Um, so think about your patients who typically have hypothyroidism and the symptoms that they exhibit anyway. So they're fatigued, they have weight gain, constipation, um, issues with temperature regulation, heart rate, um, decreased blood pressure, so those types of things. So yes, myxedema coma is a little bit misleading because they're not always comatose when this is um, diagnosed at times. So patients who are suspected of uh, having myxedema coma um, are typically patients who have undiagnosed hypothyroidism, okay? And so they're not being treated for that hypothyroidism. So again, looking back at those symptoms of hypothyroidism and then we make, you know, leave them untreated. So we're making that 10 times as bad as it is. So this can also happen with someone who's non-compliant with treatment for hypothyroidism. Okay, so don't take that off the table either. So these patients are typically going to be um, admitted into a facility just because they need some cardiovascular support. Because again, if we look back at hypothyroidism, um, we already have that decreased heart rate, we have a decreased blood pressure, and we also have a decreased respiratory rate. So again, if we're depressing that system even further, what's your patient looking like? I'm going to say pretty close to one foot in the grave, if, if you think about it in that sense. Um, so we need to treat this condition immediately. Like I said, it is an emergency. So these are the patients you're going to see in the facilities who are receiving IV levothyroxine. So if I were to ask you about myxedema coma and what medication treats it quickly or most effectively, you're going to know because I just told you it's going to be IV levothyroxine. Okay, so just remember they can be hospitalized because we already have a depressed system because we have hypothyroidism. So then we're either non-compliant with our medication or there are some other triggers that can cause um, myxedema coma. I think if you look back at the slides, I listed lithium as one of the um, things that can cause hypothyroidism. So if you have a patient who's undiagnosed and they're taking lithium, it makes it worse. That can be one of the triggers for myxedema coma. So I want you to understand what myxedema coma is. I want you to know um, the circulatory effects that it has and how we support them if this is their diagnosis, okay? It may not be in your book, I get it, but it's imperative that you understand sometimes things that are related to what we're talking about are not always gonna be in the book. So if it's in your ATI book or your other book, I'm gonna talk about it, or I may talk about it simply because it relates to what we're actually learning about. So again, I always encourage you, if you have questions and you don't understand it because it's not in the reading and you don't understand how it relates to what we're talking about, please, please just email me, okay? I'm always um, here to engage in conversation with you, so please let me know if you have any questions. So in hyperthyroidism, it is just an overactive thyroid, otherwise known as thyrotoxosis. Remember, in hyperthyroidism, we're going to have an excessively um, active metabolism, okay? So we're increasing that metabolic state. So this is going to be the complete opposite of hypothyroidism, and you're going to see the complete opposite effects or symptoms, okay? Because we're secreting way too much T3 and T4, and again, that calcitonin. So um, remember how we talked about um, the thyroid gland is our um, metabolism regulator. So if we have too much, you're going to see the complete opposite effects of hypothyroidism. I know that's not rocket science, but I just want to put that out there. Now, I will put a picture in the next slide so that you can see um, what a goiter looks like because with hyperthyroidism, they can tend to develop goiters. Um, and I just want to give you an idea of what it looks like. You may have seen one in the past, and if not, 
just know that there are varying degrees of goiters. There may be just a small, almost um, unrecognizable one. And you may have some that are like huge. I mean, it almost looks like someone else's head in their neck. Okay, so just um, know what they are. So when we talk about hyperthyroidism, we're also going to talk about Graves' disease. And I know that when you're reading your book, this is where most students become confused. So if you don't grasp this concept, then go back and listen to this lecture or reread it in your book or research it for yourself. But um, there are different causes of hypothyroidism, and the most common is Graves' disease. Now, again, this is a confusing part. So Graves' disease is the most common part of hypothyroidism. And it is basically due to an abnormal response um, in the immune system. So the immune system causes um, the thyroid to produce too much hormone. So how does that happen? Well, Graves' disease is, again, an immune disorder, an autoimmune disorder. So we're producing an antibody, okay? And in any type of autoimmune disorder, remember, it produces an antibody that begins to attack our healthy tissues. And that's where we get into trouble. So in Graves' disease, what's happening is that immune system has created that antibody. It's causing the thyroid to grow and make more thyroid hormone, okay, which we really probably don't need. And I can go into great detail and tell you about a thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin that basically tricks the thyroid into growing and producing too much hormone, which leads to hyperthyroidism, okay? And then that's where you start to see those goiters develop, okay, with that growth. So I just wanted you to understand how that works so that when you read in your book about hypothyroidism mixed in the portion of hyperthyroidism, then you would at least understand why that's relevant. So you'll see on the next slide that we'll talk about Graves' disease, you'll see a picture and you'll see in this picture um, those bulging, those protruding eyes. So also when you think about this, anytime Graves' disease is mentioned, you have to think about blurred vision. Okay, If you walk around like that all the time, you're going to have some issues in with your sight. Okay, Now, severe uh, hyperthyroidism can cause some life-threatening events. Remember, we talked about all the things that the thyroid affects. Okay, so these are referred to as your thyroid storm or your thyroid crisis. Now, when you're test taking, it's not going to say your patient has hyperthyroidism. They're going to talk about your patient is um, been diagnosed to, you know, be in thyroid crisis or your patient is experiencing thyroid storm. So you need to know what those two meaning, what those two um, things mean. Okay, don't just know the words, know what they mean. So remember, when we're in hyperthyroidism, we have all of that excess hormone circulating and it's going to affect our cardiac system. Okay, so that's where you get into the thyroid storm and thyroid crisis. Um, we're going to see an increase in heart rate, heart failure, and hypertension. Remember, we're affecting that cardiovascular system um, and that metabolism is increased. So we're working a lot harder. <clears throat> now, one of the first indications of a problem in a patient who's taking medication um, is fever. Now, if you didn't write that down, you didn't hear me say that, you better rewind and write that down because you are going to see that again. You will start to see the first sign of trouble is with your extreme temperatures when you're doing those vital signs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you may also begin to see some seizure activity. Okay, we talked about that previously with our last class of med medications and those adverse effects. Um, so this is truly an emergency, um, the thyroid storm, storm and the thyroid crisis. So we need to intervene immediately. Okay, we need to get those um, decreased levels of hormones that are circulating. Um, we need to get those leveled down. So we'll talk about that just a little bit more about how we're going to decrease those levels um, in just a few minutes. So no know the difference in thyroid storm, thyroid crisis, what you're looking for and what that actually means and what you're going to see in your patient when you're assessing them. Okay, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. 
So this is what I was talking about with the varying degrees of goiters. You can actually see on the left that this person has a small goiter, but it is not nearly the size of the person on the right. So you can see that they're varying in sizes, and I'm sure that depends on interventions, early intervention. Okay, so again, just know what they are, what causes them, and that there are varying degrees. So a couple of slides back, we talked about that thyroid storm or the thyroid crisis and how are we going to fix that? So sometimes we can do a medication intervention, give something IV, um, some of those um, antithyroid drugs to reverse that extreme um, amount of circulating hormones in the system. Now, sometimes it just requires surgical removal of all of the um, thyroid or maybe just a part of it. OK, it just depends and it varies patient to patient. So just know that in order to uh, rectify that thyroid storm or that thyroid crisis, um, we can try medications first, and that if that is unsuccessful, then we move to surgical removal, okay? Now, a couple of other things that are available is gonna be your radiation therapies. So that's gonna be your radioactive iodine. That's typically your most common treatment to try and shrink that thyroid okay it's given in a pill form and it gradually shrinks the thyroid now one of the most important things that people um, really freak out about especially if they have small children or whatever is this radiation therapy this radioactive iodine it is given in pill form but there is minimal radioactive exposure and so your family is not going to be subjected to that radioactive materials okay so make sure that your patients understand that, okay? Now, this radiation therapy, when you're taking it, it's not like, or I guess it is sort of like a cancer treatment and their um, therapies. It targets only that specific tissue that absorbs iodine. And remember I said your um, thyroid gland is the only gland in the body that has those iodine receptors. So that is the only place that is going to receive that radioactive material, that radioactive iodine for treatment, okay? So it's minimal exposure. Now, we do treat hyperthyroidism with our antithyroid drugs, okay? This is used for short-term fixes prior to surgery, okay? Um, make sure you understand that with antithyroid drugs. It is a short-term fix. This is going to be your um, methamazole and your uh, propocil or PTU. Typically, you're going to hear me refer to it as PTU because propithiouracil is a little hard to say. So just know that that's your PTU. Okay, now typically on a test, it'll have the long name and I'm going to give you PTU. Okay, just easier to say PTU throughout the whole lecture. Now, um, Let's see what else we need to talk about. Okay, so remember earlier I said when we talked about how those hormones actually are produced, I talked about how the iodine is absorbed through food or um, certain plants that are rich in soil or grown in soil that's rich in iodine. That iodine then binds with tyrosine. Okay, this is where that comes to um, or becomes an important part of the process, okay? So without that binding, it cannot produce those hormones. So this is how your antithyroid drugs work, okay? And we'll talk about it just a minute when we move on to the antithyroid drugs. Um, but that's how they're working. They're suppressing the ability of that binding of the iodide and the tyrosine, okay? So we'll talk about that again in just a minute. But just know that these are the two antithyroid drugs. Okay, so now I said antithyroid drugs are used short-term prior to surgery, so that's a temporary fix. So if we give them to someone and it's working to control that overproduction of thyroid hormones, this is when you may see them on a long-term regimen, okay? But typically they're used for short-term prior to surgery. Um, 
So just know the difference. Now, I do want you to understand when we move forward with talking about these particular drugs that they're not interchangeable, much like the other two drugs we talked about, your Synthroid and the other one. They are not interchangeable. One is extremely um, stronger than the other, okay? And we'll talk about that. So this is Graves' disease um, or hyperthyroidism. Um, remember, this is the autoimmune disorder, Graves' disease. So if you could put this side by side with the hypothyroid, then you're going to see the difference. Okay, you're going to see the two extremes. So in, with Graves' disease or hyperthyroidism, you're going to see that increase in energy. Remember, we're increasing the metabolism because we have a higher level of circulating hormones. Okay, so we've increased our energy. And so by increasing our energy, we've gotten off the couch, we've moved about, we've lost weight. Okay, sometimes even to the point of um, extreme weight loss. Okay. Um, so we've elevated our heart rate, our blood pressure with that increased energy and our ability to get up and move about. Now, with this also, we have increased heat intolerance, okay? These are your patients. Remember, in hypo, we couldn't tolerate cold, okay? So a heat intolerance is going to be with your hyperthyroidism. Remember that temperature regulation, okay? So we've increased that metabolism, so we're no longer um, tolerating heat well. Um, so that's where you're going to see that moist and that sweat increase, the sweaty skin, okay, that's what we're talking about, and that's relating to that temperature adjustment. Diarrhea, again, that goes back to increasing that metabolism and um, the GI motility, okay, so you're going to see that diarrhea. Um, irregular menstrual cycles, again, that just goes back to the circulating hormones, and remember we talked about estrogen and how those hormones in turn that are secreted from the thyroid affect the amount of estrogen in the body and um, testosterone. Okay, so that's where you get those irregular menstrual cycles and that's why people have such a problem getting pregnant when um, they suffer from thyroid issues, okay? So these two drugs, when used, again, will not affect any um, stored hormone that is already in the system, okay? So your patient may take these for several weeks before they start to see um, a change, okay? So just be sure that you're mindful of that when you're educating your patient. It can take up to two to three, four weeks um, before they see changes. So our antithyroid drug, this is our PTU and our methimazole. Um, again, I said previously, we absolutely positively do not substitute one for the other. Methimazole is 10 times stronger than PTU. So imagine if you just 
you know, you didn't have PTU available and you gave them a thimerosal, it works the same way, but you're going to overdose your patient. So we know we never substitute unless the pharmacy sends us a specific substitution in which we should still be double checking our cells. So remember, methamazole is 10 times stronger than PTU. Now, the side effects with this um, classification is going to be um, impaired sense of taste, puritis or, you know, itchiness of the skin, muscle and joint aches. Remember that calcitonin does affect um, muscle activity. Okay, so you may um, see some aches there and joints. Remember, it affects our bone. Um, so nausea and vomiting, that may, be just, may just be related to taking it on an empty stomach, um, enlarged lymph nodes, swelling of the lower extremities, and even headaches. Remember, again, it affects a lot of areas of our cardiovascular system. So you may see some of that edema in the lower extremities and headache. So these are just some of the reported side effects, <clears throat> some of the expected side effects. So just be mindful that you know what those are because remember on our last test how important it was in knowing those side effects and those adverse effects in order to, to be successful when you're doing select all that apply. I know they're tough. I had to take them myself, but it's imperative that you know those side effects. So some adverse effects with um, our antithyroid drugs is, of course, always going to be your um, allergic reactions, or your hypersensitivities. And again, that just goes back to looking for those um, reported allergies in the history. Bone marrow suppression. Now think about why an adverse reaction for this particular medication would be bone marrow suppression and what that means to have bone marrow suppression. So remember I talked earlier on about T3 and T4 and its effects on testosterone. Okay, well, testosterone is an, an it's called an erythropoietic, okay, hormone, meaning it can affect the production or the formation of increased red blood cells, okay? And remember calcitonin is also important in bone production because it affects the activity of those um, osteoclasts, okay? So the breakdown and building up of that um, bone. And so we all know that where do we get our red blood cells from? Bone marrow, okay? So when you're thinking about the adverse effects, don't just know bone marrow suppression. Know what that means when it comes to testing time. What else are you going to look for, okay? Look for that formation of red blood cells or a decrease in a patient's red blood cells because your bone marrow production has been suppressed. Um, hepatotoxicities, um, this is typically seen with the PTU, okay? Um, hepatitis, coleostatic jaundice, and liver failure, okay? So what are you looking for in your patient when you see hepatitis, jaundice, and liver failure? You're gonna look for that yellowing of the eyes, yellowing of the skin, gray, that clay colored stools, or maybe even some um, coffee looking urine, okay? So look for those things when you're testing. Don't just know that the adverse effects is hepatitis, jaundice, liver failure. Know what you're looking for if you know that there's a hepatotoxicity that occurs with PTU. Know when you look at your patient, they're yellow. They have, you know, gray stool I just looked at and they're taking PTU. I need to report that immediately because it's an adverse effect, okay? Um, teratogenic, um, especially in the first trimester of pregnancy, um, methamazole and there's another one called uh, carbam, carba, carbamazole, which is only available in um, Canada. So we don't have to worry about that one, but you do need to know that methamazole is a teratogenic in the first trimester of pregnancy. So again, if you have a patient that is within childbearing age, you need to make sure that if they're taking this, um, they're using 
either birth control or if they're thinking of getting pregnant and they're not using birth control, then they need to look at switching that medication, which we'll talk about, okay? They can take PTU instead of methamazole um, during that first trimester, okay? Which you'll see I have right underneath there. PTU is recommended in the first trimester because it is not known to have those teratid teratogenic effects, okay? So know the difference in your uh, medications and if you have a pregnant uh, mom, which one you're gonna give her because I will guarantee you, you're gonna see that one. So know the difference. Now, once you've established which medication you give in the first trimester, um, after that first trimester, you can switch back to the methamazole um, because remember I just told you PTU can cause um, some hepatotoxicity um, as an adverse effect. So we're trying to do a balancing act in pregnant women, okay? So I'm telling you now, write it down, mark this slide. You're going to know that because it's extremely important to know that we don't just skip over pregnant women because we've decided we're going to work in, you know, I don't know, med surge or whatever. It's important to know those effects so that when you're doing a reconciliation, if you're in the ER and you see that and you better do a pregnancy test. Okay. So be mindful of all of those adverse effects because you are going to see them again. Now, hepatotoxicity, I do want to mention, how do we know if we've caused some liver failure, liver damage? Well, we're going to do some liver function testing, okay? And if you don't remember what those liver function tests are, go back and look them up. So what are the nursing responsibilities in giving this medication or prior to giving this medication? Well, first we're gonna monitor our vital signs. Of course, we talked about why we're increasing that metabolism. Therefore, we're increasing the workload in our cardiovascular system. So we wanna make sure that we are in fact monitoring those. And remember I said, temperature is the number one um, indicator for an issue with thyroid medications. Remember, that's going to lead us into that thyroid storm and that thyroid crisis. So remember that temperature and vital signs, important. Um, we're going to monitor a CBC. That's a complete blood count. Um, we want to monitor for, again, that um, bone marrow suppression. Remember, if we don't have enough red blood cells um, to carry that hemoglobin and oxygen to our body and the cells, we're going to um, we're going to see a decrease in our O2 saturations and um, our level of consciousness and our activity levels and things like that. And then we're going to see some anemia. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to monitor for that. Again, you're going to reconcile those drug interactions. Again, that goes back to your anticoagulants, your blood thinners, um, and your assessment. Um, you're going to assess for bleeding, bruising, petechiae, okay? You're going to assess for bleeding in all those places we've talked about before, um, gums, anything in the GI tract that you might see um, in the urine or stool, okay? And then we're going to do some, hopefully some, before you ever start a patient on this medication, we're going to do some liver function testing prior to starting this medication. Remember, because I said that PTU can be hepatotoxic. So 
I, as a nurse, would like to see my baseline before I ever administer a medication to a patient. I may want to see a bilirubin. I may want to see an albumin testing um, in the lab. I may want to see what their baseline is for their PT, PTT, INR. What is their normal um, window for their bleeding time or their clotting time prior to starting this, especially if they're taking an anticoagulant, okay? I want to know those things. So why would I want to know about albumin? Well, albumin is an enzyme um, or a protein that is made by the liver, okay? And so albumin helps us keep the fluid in the bloodstream rather than allowing it to leak out into tissues. So that's important to know. Albumin also um, helps deliver things such as hormones and other enzymes and even vitamins for our body to absorb. So it's extremely important for us to know some of those lab values before we start giving this medication to our patients, okay? So if you guys have any questions about those liver function testing or anything like that, please let me know. We'll talk a little bit more about it. So your education piece for um, antithyroid drugs, uh, your meth methamazole and your PTU are pretty similar to your um, thyroid agonist, okay? You want them to take as directed. We don't want to skip doses. Don't stop abruptly. Be mindful of those two to three hour windows prior to meals, okay? Fiber supplements, again, we want to make sure that we're not um, processing that medication too quickly so it can absorb appropriately, okay? Remember, make them check their pulse daily and report that greater than 20 beats per minute if they notice that. Again, we've um, increased that metabolism, therefore we've increased the workload of our heart and our cardiovascular system. So if you have chest pain or um, any signs that you may be having a um, um, heart attack, you need to call EMS, report to the ER immediately, okay? Um, again, educating them on the importance of following up with those labs, getting those labs done appropriately and on time. Um, again, avoiding aspirin um, with those medications if at all possible, because again, um, it can affect bleeding time. So we want to make sure that we're educating them to avoid those. Now, we also talked about um, PTU and that it can be hepatotoxic. So what are, what are some of the things that you can teach your patient about um, as far as jaundice without them having to come and do a lab? Well, you can teach them to look in the roof of their mouth or their gums to see if they look yellowish or even the whites of their eyes. Do they suspect that maybe there's a yellow tint to the whites of their eyes where there was not before? If there is, call your physician. They will ask you to either come in and let us check it. We'll run some labs, um, but don't not do anything, okay? Teach them about that. They don't have to have fancy lab work to see the yellowing of the eyes, okay? So be mindful of that. Even when you're test taking, know that some of those things that they can do and you can even look for yourself without ever having to do a lab. Look for the yellowing of the skin, eyes, and um, your um, mouth, the roof of your mouth. So PTU again has advantages and disadvantages. So some of the advantages um, is that it does have that lower risk of birth defects um, and it is our first line of treatment in pregnant women. However, you have to remember the time frame that's first trimester only because of its risk of liver um, toxicity. So the disadvantage is that PTU is only available in 100 to 150 milligrams, which means your patient may have to take that more often, which could mean non-compliance, or it could mean that they're spending more money because they're having to purchase this particular medication more often <clears throat> or more of it. So anyway, just know that there are advantages and disadvantages to PTU. So methamazole, again, I just want to remind you of some of the benefits is that it can reduce hyperthyroidism quickly. So remember we talked about that um, thyroid storm um, 
this is when you're going to start to see this be your first line of defense. Now, remember, it is also 10 times more powerful than PTU. So that's why it reverses quickly, obviously. Um, and then also recall that methamazole is teratogenic and remember how it's used in pregnancy. So just as a reminder, um, I put this in here because it's extremely important that you understand the benefits and um, the um, downside of each of them. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is pretty common. Um, this is just one of those autoimmune disorders in which our body, of course, makes antibodies and attacks our healthy thyroid tissue. Um, it's just, again, affecting the ability to produce and secrete those hormones. And most suspected um, causes is either just a person's genes or there's some type of environmental trigger. Okay, so just kind of be familiar with what Hashimoto's thyroiditis is um, and that it is in fact an autoimmune disorder, which we've talked about a couple of autoimmune disorders previously. So just kind of know what that is. Know that it is producing an antibody that is attacking that um, healthy tissue. So let's talk about the adrenal gland and the function of it before we get into the hypo and hyperfunction of this particular gland. Now, the adrenal gland, if you remember from A and P, um, is just a triangular shaped gland that sits right ab um, above the kidneys. Um, the adrenal gland plays an important role, of course, in blood pressure regulation. And then um, we'll talk about how it does so. There are two portions. Uh, of the adrenal gland, there's the cortex and the medulla. So in the cortex, um, it's secreting your aldosterone. So it's important to know what aldosterone is and how it affects the body so that you understand um, also how it relates to hormones. Um, aldosterone is a hormone that is secreted by the adrenal gland. And again, it mainly works in the kidneys and the colon to increase the amount of sodium that's reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And then it also increases the amount of potassium that is excreted in urine. Okay, so make sure you understand that. Now, aldosterone is also important um, when we talk about blood pressure regulation because it does uh, regulate that water reabsorption in sodium. So therefore, it can increase the volume of blood that we have circulating. So if you also think back, anytime we have um, a larger amount of circulating blood, our blood pressure is going to tend to be on the higher side. Now, it also secretes cortisol, and we've talked about cortisol many times. Um, cortisol is our body's natural alarm system. Um, remember, it affects our wake-sleep cycle. Um, it controls our mood. It can have um, an effect on inflammation and blood sugar. Remember, it is our main stress hormone in the body, and remember, it plays a part in our fight or flight, um, so just remember that. Now, aldosterone and cortisol are both corticosteroids. Now, why are they both considered steroids? Well, that is because they're both comprised of a steroid cholesterol. Okay, so there's a chain of events that come into play in producing both aldosterone and cortisol. And I'll put a slide in to show you the cascade. But both of them are produced from cholesterol. Cholesterol is then converted to progesterone, which is then converted into aldosterone, cortisol, testosterone, and ultimately um, estradiol or estrogen. So that's how they're all related um, to those sex hormones, okay? That's where they come from. So you can see how important the adrenal, the adrenal gland is in blood pressure regulation along with all of those other things, um, sexual function, maturation, all of those things. So let's move on and we'll talk about the hypofunction of the adrenal gland. This is just here for a visual. This is when I was talking about cholesterol uh, is where we get our progesterone from. Progesterone then is transferred into or transposed into aldosterone, cortisol, testosterone, and estradiol. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a visual so you could see kind of what I was talking about when I mentioned 
the cholesterol and the cascade of events that occur in order to get to aldosterone and cortisol production. So adrenal gland hypofunction is just that. It produces little to no cortisol and aldosterone. Okay, so you know how important that is that we have those two functioning appropriately because of all of the side effects it can cause. Um, so there's two categories, primary and secondary. So with primary, that is just you've had some type of damage or injury to the adrenal gland. Say, for instance, you've been in a motor vehicle accident. Typically, that happens um, when you've had some type of kidney injury also in a, an accident because it sits right on top of that kidney. Anyway, so just know that primary is when that adrenal gland is damaged, therefore decreasing the production or its ability to function and secrete that cortisol and aldosterone. Now, the secondary um, cause of um, hypofunction in the adrenal gland is typically because your pituitary gland has some type of tumor. So what happens is the pituitary gland secretes a hormone that is called adrenocorticotropic hormone or just ACTH that basically um, causes your adrenal gland to secrete cortisol. It regulates cortisol. So that's our stress hormone. So secondary is caused by tumors. So know the difference. Primary is damage. Secondary is caused by a tumor. Some of the other causes for adrenal hypofunction could be, um, it's been removed, obviously. Um, any type of radiation therapy could also cause that hypofunction. So um, keep those in the back of your mind also. So some of the effects of adrenal insufficiency or that hypofunction is going to be, of course, your hypoglycemia. Remember, cortisol, um, you're not getting enough cortisol circulating in there. So your blood pressure, sorry, your blood sugar is going to be affected by that. So we need to make sure that you're checking those blood glucose levels because they're going to be hypoglycemic. You're going to have salt wasting. Okay, think about what aldosterone does. Remember, um, it reabsorbs that in the um, kidneys. So if it's not appropriate, then we're going to have salt wasting. And then we run into hypotension, which is next. Okay, um, again, we have less circulating volume, so we're going to have a lower blood pressure, which is going to lead to some weakness because we just don't have enough energy to get up and go. And if you think about if we don't have enough circulating blood volume, then we're not going to probably be as active because it takes a lot more effort with that reduced um, circulating blood because we don't have enough oxygen circulating to the cells to be active. Um, and then hyperkalemia, remember when we talked about what um, aldosterone does to potassium? Think about it. So if we're not functioning appropriately, we're not excreting that potassium so therefore, we're going to be hyperkalemia. So what do we see when we have a patient who has hyperkalemia? Well, we're going to see muscle weakness, fatigue, and you might even see some cardiac function there um, be affected. May have some heart palpitations and those types of things. So you're going to have to know what your side effects are uh, or your uh, effects of hypofunctioning in this particular gland. So when we talk about medications that are going to be ordered for adrenal hypofunction, you have to think about corticosteroids. We've talked about that numerous times in the past. So if you don't remember all of the things that we're going to skim over um, about corticosteroids, go back and look at that. Okay, so corticosteroids are very similar to our natural cortisol. So they're going to prescribe those corticosteroids to replace that. Um, cortisol that's missing. So that's going to be your prednisone, your methylprednisone, 
methylprednisolone, sorry, and your dexamethasone. Remember, corticosteroids play an important part in lowering that inflammation or decreasing inflammation. Remember what the side effects are of corticosteroids. Remember it affects blood sugar. Some of those other things, bleeding, go back and look at those. You guys should know those by now. You should be able to pick those out on a test, okay? Um, one of the big thing is reducing that immune system. Remember, it reduces immunity. Corticosteroids are used for various things. Um, asthma, arthritis, all of those things. Um, remember, cortisol is important. It is that essential stress hormone. That's our body's alarm system. I've showed you some of the things. I've talked about some of the things it controls and how important that is. So cortisol is also huge in um, managing the usage of the foods that we eat, the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins. Okay, so know some of those things. So remember, that's where um, when we talk about taking corticosteroids, that Cushing syndrome comes into play. Because if we don't have enough cortisol to manage all of those carbohydrates and those fats that we take in, we're going to see those fat stores increase. And therefore, we're going to see that weight gain and that fat um, redistribution that we talked about on the back of the neck and that moon face. Remember the buffalo hump and the moon face. If you don't remember that, please go back and revisit that because it's important that you understand that and how cortisol affects the body because you're going to be tested on that. Um, again, cortisol plays an important part in um, blood sugar, blood pressure regulation, okay, um, energy, and all of that, restoring all of that. So make sure you go back and revisit those corticosteroids. Also remember that just like every other medication, these are not interchangeable, okay, just because um, methylprednisolone has prednisone in it or a stem of that, it does not matter. They're not interchangeable. So check your dosages and make sure you have the right medication before administering that to your patient. If we have given our patients some type of corticosteroid, those um, prednisolone or the prednisone, and it hasn't worked, then we're going to give them uh, hydrocortisone um, to replace that aldosterone to manage those blood levels, the blood sodium levels. Okay, so when corticosteroids have failed, then we move to this particular drug. So this one in particular prevents hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypotension. Okay, so this drug um, allows for more sodium to be retained at the kidneys, okay, and it increases um, that potassium excretion. Okay, so that way we avoid that hyperkalemia and all of the side effects that comes along with that. <clears throat> So by doing so, we also prevent hypotension because we have a larger volume of blood circulating because we were able to increase that sodium absorption, um, therefore increasing our blood circulating volume. Okay. Now the side effects of this particular medication are going to be hypertension, edema formation, low potassium, and high sodium. Well, if you look at what it prevents, um, some of the side effects, and it could be dose dependent, again, those side effects are all based on, um, if you look back, hypertension is because now we have a greater level of blood volume circulating. Your edema is because now we have more sodium that we are retaining, okay? So that's where your edema comes into play. Um, low potassium is going to come into play because we've excreted so much potassium that now we have hypokalemia. Okay, so um, all of those are just electrolyte imbalances. So we have to kind of play with the dosages if we see that we've moved into the wrong direction with those medications. Now, the adverse effects of this particular medication is congestive heart failure. Okay, so we all know that if we are um, retaining fluids and we're retaining more salt um, or sodium, we're naturally going to put more work on the heart and the cardiac system 
or the circulatory system, so then that's when you're going to start seeing that congestive heart failure. We have too much of that retained um, fluid, okay? So you're going to see that fluid volume overload. So be mindful of that. And remember, when you're educating your patients, make sure that you educate them on what fluid volume overload looks like, okay? The swelling, the hypertension, those types of things, okay? Now, as far as your um, patient teaching and education, let's just go ahead and talk about that. Um, with all of that weight gain, or not weight gain, but with the fluid retention, you may see some weight gain. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna ask our patients to weigh themselves daily. Um, if you've ever worked in a cardiac floor, then you'll know that nine times out of 10, you're gonna see those patients weighed every single morning or at least once daily, because we want to know if that medication is working, are we excreting that excessive water um, or fluids or not? Okay, we don't want that buildup of excessive fluid. That's where we run into the um, edema, the weight gain and the heart failure, okay? So one of the most important things that you need to know is if you have a patient who is um, in fact taking this medication, if they have a weight gain of two pounds or more in a day or three pounds in a week, they need to report that to their healthcare provider immediately. Remember, all of that excess fluid floating around in there is causing your heart to have to work harder. So we want to stop that immediately. So have them refer or contact their provider for that. Okay, so know your side effects, your adverse effects about this particular medication. It's extremely important that you understand what it prevents. And by preventing that, sometimes we can cause the opposite and then we need to know how to adjust it. So adrenal insufficiency and corticosteroids, I told you in the previous slide how that is relative or related to the treatment of um, hypoaldosterone. Um, so again, aldosterone regulates that sodium and potassium, the reabsorption of water, um, so typically it is treated with glucocorticoids alone. Now, as I said, if that does not increase the production of aldosterone, then they will add Floraneth. So remember Floraneth and um, increasing that aldosterone production, think about those um, side effects that it can have and those adverse effects, and it can cause that congestive heart failure, and I've already told you why. So if you didn't remember that from the previous slide, go back and listen to it one more time. So hypoaldosteronism is, of course, Addison's disease, okay? This is your adrenocortical insufficiency, that hypofunctioning um, adrenal gland. So you'll see the hypoglycemia, we talked about that, the cortisol levels are decreased, so therefore you're gonna have hypoglycemia. That postural hypotension is again related to that regulation of blood pressure. So be mindful of um, teaching your patients to change positions slowly, so we reduce the risk of falls, okay? Weight loss, again, we've um, lacking that cortisol, so we see that weight loss. Weakness, we talked about. The GI disturbances, we've talked about almost all of this. Um, and basically, um, the only one we really haven't talked about is the bronze pigmentation of skin. And that, we, we sort of talked about what causes it, but not specifically. So the bronze skin comes from an excess of that, um, if I say this correctly, adrenocorticotropic um, hormone okay so basically what happens is it just it, there's an excess of it and it acts on those mel um, the melanin of our skin and it just produces an over um, secretion of that so that's why you have that pins bron i can't even talk i'm so sorry bronze pigmentation of the skin so you also see at the bottom um, the adrenal crisis you're going to see that profound fatigue dehydration um, that decreased blood pressure, which is gonna cause vascular collapse, renal shutdown. Remember, um, aldosterone works in the kidneys. Um, so you're gonna see that decreased serum sodium levels and your increased serum potassium. So remember, go back and look at what um, hyperkalemia looks like in your patient, okay? So that you can 
recognize that in your testing. So how do we test for this? I'm just going to go ahead and put this out there while we're talking about it. So the it, it's hard to determine, but the one thing that um, stands out in a diagnosis of Addison's disease is basically an unexplained continual state of um, hyperkalemia. Okay, that um, serum potassium just continually being elevated. Okay. Um, so that's really how we diagnose Addison's disease, okay? So they're not excreting that potassium correctly, and so that's where we run into that issue. So that is the one thing that will lead most physicians to a diagnosis of Addison's disease is that continual serum potassium being elevated. Okay, so let's now talk about adrenal hyperfunction. Again, hyper just simply means there's too much of it. Okay, so typically with adrenal hyperfunction, it's one hormone or the other. So you're either going to have an excess production of cortisol or aldosterone. It's typically not both of them. So if you have an excess of <clears throat> cortisol, then you're going to have hyper cortisolism. Okay, that's your Cushing's disease. And I'll put a picture of that in the next slide, which you've seen that in the past. But anyway, just so you'll have a visual. Then if you have an increase in the hormone aldosterone, that is where you get your hyperaldosteronism. Okay, now typically the um, most common reason for an increase of one secretion uh, or one hormone being secreted over the other is the tumor, those tumors that are on that pituitary gland, okay? And so most of the time, surgery is <clears throat> how they're going to alleviate that over secretion, okay? So um, just know that typically tumors are the reason for that hyperfunction, okay? So this is Cushing syndrome. This is a picture representation of what your patient may look like if they have a diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. So Cushing syndrome is typically seen with um, prolonged use of glucocorticoids, um, those steroids. Okay, we've talked about this previously. So this is just um, a condition that's caused by that exposure either with the steroid use or the excessive um, exposure or prolonged exposure to um, that elevated cortisol level. Okay, so if we have hyper um, function of our adrenal gland and we have all of that cortisol floating around, then 
this is what you might see in your patient. Okay, we've talked about the fat pad, the buffalo hump, the moon face. Um, of course, wound healing goes back to um, overall just that circulatory process. And remember, your diabetics are also affected by, by those um, glucocorticoids, that cortisol. And remember, your diabetic patients tend to have a prolonged healing time um, in relation to those of us who may not have diabetes or may not be, you know, taking those glucocorticoids. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give you a picture of what this um, syndrome looks like. So typically with adrenal gland and the hyperfunction, I said to you that surgery is typically the cure. Um, but for those who do not or cannot have surgery, those who maybe their health status will not allow them to have surgery, um, we treat those with a couple of things, corticosteroid receptor blockers and steroid production inhibitors. But I first want to talk to you about one particular thing before we move forward with those two particular drugs. So when we treat um, adrenal gland hyperfunction, what's happening is um, if it's too much aldosterone that is present, then we're treating hyperaldosteronism. And you'll read this in your book. Um, I think it's on page 298. If you read through there, it's at the bottom of the page. Um, so I want to take you back for just a moment to what aldosterone does, so bear with me. Remember, aldosterone increases that potassium excretion in the urine, okay? So if you have hyperaldosteronism, then you're excreting a ton of potassium in the urine, okay? And we all know that potassium plays an important part in cardiac function, okay? So it helps our heart beat regular, and so if we're wasting all of it, um, we're excreting it in the urine, then our heart is probably not functioning very well, along with a couple of other body parts that need that potassium to function well. So the answer to fixing hyperaldosteronism, the easiest way to explain that is the use of diuretics. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you about diuretics. So you may or may not recall, you might not have learned this just yet, but there are various types of diuretics we have potassium wasting and we have potassium sparing diuretics. So in this case, we would want to give our patient a potassium sparing diuretic. Um, so spirolactone is typically what I see um, given and it just helps to excrete that fluid or any excess fluid, but it prevents the loss of potassium in the urine. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to you because that's the easiest way I can explain it. So if you have further questions about hyperaldosteronism and the use of diuretics um, and the reason they're using potassium sparing, please let me know. Okay, don't hesitate. That's why I'm here. Um, I also put a little slide or cartoon in this slide. It's in Mosby's little card that shows you what happens when you don't have enough potassium. Okay, when you don't have enough potassium, you're going to see that. Um, weak muscles and you know different things here you can read about that so I just wanted you to understand how important it is that we um, balance that potassium so another option for treating an overactive adrenal gland is a corticosteroid receptor blocker which is your mefepristone or corlum as your brand name. But mefepristone is one that interferes with um, the binding of cortisol at the receptor site. So we know that anytime we're interrupting the action at the receptor site, we consider that an antagonist. Okay, so a corticosteroid receptor blocker um, in this case is acting as an antagonist. So Again, I know that you guys probably know this, but by blocking cortisol at that receptor site, typically and I say typically because I want you to listen closely, we would say that we have less circulating cortisol, but when you read about the adrenal gland and hyperfunction, you're going to see that it tells you that mefepristone does not reduce cortisol levels. It inhibits the response at the tissue site 
Okay, so it inhibits cortisol response in different tissues. Okay, so remember it this way. Um, mifepristone changes the response. It doesn't change the level of cortisol that's circulating. Okay, I mean, I know we preach about antagonists and that it typically lowers the amount of a circulating hormone, whatever it is. But in this case, it works differently. It works at the site of the tissue um, receptor to change that. So if this medication is working correctly for your patient, just like your other medications, you're going to start to see some improvements in the disease process or the symptoms of their disease. Um, Cushing's disease. So you're going to see the blood glucose level out, maybe their blood pressure levels out, some of those um, potassium levels are going to start to decrease. Okay, so um, those are some of the things that you're going to look for to make sure that these are actually effective for your patient. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this because I promise you're going to see this again. A couple of notes of interest with this particular medication with mifepristone is as follows. This drug is only given to patients who have type 2 diabetes and hyperglycemia who suffer from um, that hyperfunctioning adrenal gland. Okay, again, this medication is strictly for type 2 diabetics. Okay, and if I say it twice and I stress it, you're going to see it. Um, so make sure that you make notes of that, um, replay it, whatever you need to do, but just make sure that you understand that. Now, mifepristone is also, if you look it up in a drug book, you're going to see that it is also a medication that's used, um, or not used, but can induce uh, abortion or miscarriage. So make sure that if you have a patient who is either taking this or newly prescribed that you assess their pregnancy status okay if they're of childbearing age they need to be using contraception they need to be using two methods not just one two okay because again it can cause miscarriage um, and or induce abortion so make sure that you understand that so one way to um differentiate these two particular medications is by those outliers and I've mentioned that I think once or twice before knowing something outside of what they both do will separate that medication when it comes to testing time so if you need to drag out those ATI templates and write them out I didn't require you to do them this time because you have a lot of other work to do in your study guide but if that helps you see or pinpoint the differences in medications, by all means use them. They're there, you might as well use them. If they help, if they're helpful to you, use them. Some of you, some of you may remember this medication earlier in years. Some of you probably aren't even old enough to even remember 20 years ago, 20 some years ago. But this particular medication um, was called RU486 when it first came out. So some of you may recall this particular medication because they used it um, to induce abortion. So that might be a little tidbit that helps you remember that. I don't know. But anyway, just be mindful of pregnancy status, contraception, and two methods. Steroid production inhibitors, this is going to be your um, mitotane or your lysodrine. Um, these are steroid production inhibitors, and we've talked about inhibitors before, so you guys know that anytime we talk about an inhibitor, um, we're going to have less of something produced or secreted. Okay, so lysodrine, lysodrine sorry, just reduces the symptoms of hypercortisolism by preventing the adrenal cortex from producing those hormones, okay, and cortisol. So by blocking the adrenal glands ability to secrete um, hormones and cortisol, we have less of that cortisol floating around in the body, okay. So steroid production inhibitors reduces the symptoms of hypercortisolism 
um, in Cushing's disease by blocking that secretion, okay, in the adrenal cortex. We don't have all of that cortisol floating around, so we don't have as much of an effect in the disease process of Cushing's as we would if we had all of that excess um, cortisol in the body. Now, if your patient is taking a steroid production inhibitor, you're going to start to see an improvement in the symptoms that they suffer from with Cushing's disease. Okay, you're going to see um, muscle weakness, that hyperglycemia, and fatigue. You're going to start to see those symptoms slowly start to improve. Okay, so anything that they might suffer from with Cushing's disease. As long as that medication, that lysodrin, is functioning and working appropriately for them, you're going to start to see improvement in their symptoms. <clears throat> so um, lysodrin must be taken every six to eight hours. Okay, so again, that goes back to compliance. We want to make sure they're compliant because once we get those symptoms under control or we alleviate them to some extent, we don't want them on a seesaw, up and down, up and down, okay? Take it with food so we avoid that GI upset, okay? And then um, steroid production inhibitors, of course, if we're inhibiting something and um, we had an overproduction of it and now we've stopped production, so we're reverting back to a state of hypo-functioning, so you want to educate them on the signs and symptoms of that adrenal insufficiency or that hypofunctioning adrenal gland. Okay, just looking for those particular um, symptoms. So what are the signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency so that your patient knows? That's going to be your hypoglycemia, salt wasting. You're going to have hypotension or low blood pressures. They're going to be weak. And then if they have lab levels, they're probably going to see that potassium level increased, okay? So those are your signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency. So by taking the steroid production inhibitors, we're turning down that cortisol, so you're going to see some signs and symptoms of that. So just be mindful of teaching them what to look for. Um, educate them on the importance of lab work. Remember, we're inhibiting um, the cortisol and what our adrenal gland does and so remember, our adrenal gland also secretes aldosterone, which balances our sodium levels um, and potassium. So make sure that you understand so you can educate your patient on this also. And we'll talk a little bit more about it as we go into the next um, category of medications also. But just take a couple notes on those, okay? Because I can just about assure you 99% they're going to be asking you about sodium and potassium levels with these particular drug categories. So just know how they affect sodium and potassium specifically. The side effects of your corticosteroid receptor blockers and also your steroid production inhibitors are similar. They're pretty much the same with a few exceptions. So I highly encourage you to remember the exceptions, okay? So the common side effects with both of them are your nausea, vomiting, skin rash, and some dizziness. So uh, mitotain can also cause bloody urine. So remember that, okay? I'm telling you, nine times out of 10, they're gonna ask you about the outlying portions of a drug category. So. Just know that this one, menstrual irregularities, if you think back to mifepristone, it can cause abortion, okay? So it affects that area um, that should lead you to some menstrual irregularities also, okay? So mifepristone um, causes abortion and menstrual irregularities. So if you have a patient who's trying to get pregnant, may have some complications, we want to try um, to avoid that completely in those patients, okay? Um, we're going to go a different route. We're going to try the um, lasodrin with that patient, okay? So think about those outliers with each drug. Remember, hematuria is going to be blood in the urine, and that's your midotain. And then think about your mifepristone and your menstrual irregularities 
because it can also lead to induced abortion or miscarriage. So relate those two when you're studying. So as far as adverse effects of these two categories, um, of course, you always have the issues with allergies with any medication, but this one specifically lists mefepristone um, in allergic reactions. Okay, so be mindful of that one. Any type of um, allergic reaction that may um, impair their breathing, swelling of the lips, tongue, face, throat, anything at all whatsoever, you need to report that immediately. I don't think you guys um, have any issues with recognizing that. So again, going back to that mefepristone, remember it induces abortion. That is an adverse effect. We don't want to give it. Okay, it can cause a miscarriage induced abortion. So we just avoid that. Um, adverse effects. Remember, we're going back to teaching them about adrenal insufficiency and what to look for so that they know whether they're suffering from the adverse effects of this medication or not. So what were those um, hypofunctioning problems that you would educate your patient to recognize? Again, that's going to be going back to your hypoglycemia. You're going to go back to hypotension, muscle weakness, overall weakness, and those increased potassium levels. Okay, so teach them to look for those things so that they know whether or not they're experiencing adverse effects from either of those medications. So patient education with this group of medications is simply reinforcing the importance of appointments for follow-up lab work. If you think about why, we're going to go back to aldosterone and what it affects. That's our sodium, our potassium, our water, that whole electrolyte system. We want to make sure it's in, in balance. Okay, We don't want more or less of either of those because they're extremely important. Um, to our everyday functioning as far as cardiac and various other things. So we want to make sure they understand the importance of keeping those follow-up appointments. Now, as far as reporting symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, again, we need to teach them what they're looking for when we talk about adrenal insufficiency because the medication we're giving them, if they're experiencing an adverse reaction to that, they're going to experience adrenal insufficiency symptoms. So again, that's going to be your low blood sugars, your low blood pressures, weakness, those types of symptoms. Now, the medications we just talked about, one of the side effects um, that is typically expected is nausea and vomiting. So the last thing we want to do is have our patient taking a medication on an empty stomach that we already know causes nausea and vomiting. So again, teaching them to take it with food. Birth control, contraception, um, some people are a little reluctant to talk about that, but we need to truly um, educate our patients on the importance of birth control and not only just using one method. We know that one method is not fail-proof. Um, so two methods of birth control because of the risks that we have with that mefepristone, um, that induced abortion or miscarriage. We don't want to unknowingly cause harm to a fetus um, so we want to avoid that, okay, especially in those who are childbearing years. So make sure you educate them on the importance of all of those. 